using health assessments to predict care utilization by, um, by seniors. Um, and we will hear about Kaiser Permanente's integrated health assessment tool that is designed to predict utilization patterns in, the, in care needs for seniors. We are joined today by Charlotte Christ, Project Manager for, in the Department of Senior Programs at Kaiser, and Matt Stiefel, Senior Director at Kaiser's Center for Population Healthcare Management Institute. So before we get going, just a couple of housekeeping items. Um, the first thing is, is many of you logged in, um, you should see a little poll. We're just um, asking if people could answer a few brief questions just about what their background is. Um, just helps us get a sense of who's in the audience um, and um, helps us and in, in the, in the speakers as well. And at the end of the, um, the webinar today, we're also going to have a sh short survey, just again, a couple of questions that we would love to get some feedback on to help us improve things in the future. Um, today's session will be recorded, and um, <clears throat> the slides and the recording will be posted on the CIN website site in about a week. Um, if people could please um, turn off pagers, background noises, et cetera, that would be most appreciated, just to keep the distractions to a minimum. Um, and we will be saving some time for Q&A today, so um, if you have questions, uh, if you have any logistics questions along the way, you can use your chat function just to ask the host. But if you have any questions for the speakers, you can also use the chat function, but if you could uh, send the questions to all participants so people can, can see what questions are out there and it might generate some other ideas for questions. Um, <clears throat> so, um, uh, Today's speakers, um, just want to introduce them before handing it over to them. Um, first, we're going to hear from Matt Stiefel, who directs the Center for Population Health and Kaiser Permanente's Care Management Institute. He was a 2008-09 uh, fellow with the Institute for Healthcare Improvement and continues as a faculty member for the IHI Triple AIM. Matt joined uh, Kaiser in 1981 as a medical economist and later held management positions in KP Northwest. Direct, um, directing planning, marketing, and medical economics. He joins the care and he joined the Care Management Institute as a director of measurement in 1998 and became the associate director of CMI in 2000. Pr uh, prior to Kaiser, he served as policy analyst in the Carter administration, domestic policy staff, and in the U.S. Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, and as a local health planner in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, he recently completed coursework toward an MS in ep epidemiology from the Harvard School of Public Health, and uh, holds an MPA from the Wharton School and a BA in psychology from Stanford. And Matt has been married to Jean Henderson for 33 years, has two grown children, Julia and Oliver, and a brand new daughter-in-law, <laughs> Hillary. <laughs> Thanks for that last little bit. <laughs> Always the important part, right? <laughs> um, after Mark, Matt, we're going to hear from Charlotte Christ, who is a project manager at Kaiser Permanente, Colorado, in their Department of Senior Programs, with over 20 years of professional experience in the healthcare industry, including critical care nursing, public health management, project management, and chronic condition management coaching. Before joining Kaiser Permanente, Charlotte led operations and new sales initiatives as the regional director of clinical operations for a global diagnostic and health improvement company. In her work with Kaiser, Charlotte is currently assigned to facilitate operational implement implementation of geriatric strategies that are focused on innovations in care delivery, clinical outcomes, and member satisfaction with a particular focus on Medicare quality and compliance. Current focus areas include annual prevention visits and associated health risk assessments using predictive anal analysis and in in their approach to health care delivery. Charlotte is a registered nurse with a specific interest in geriatric care and much, most of her, much of her experience supports her passionate focus on the unique, unique needs of the expanding senior population and integration of process changes to predict and meet these needs. Um, so with that, I will it over, hand it over to Matt, and um, we'll be publishing the results from just the brief poll that um, um, uh, you all took. So if anyone's interested in, that, in the results, they'll be up um, on your screen in, in a few moments. So Matt, let me just click over to your slides and hand hand over the presenter ball to you. You should be good to go. Great, thanks, Lori. Um, so, and thanks for those those uh, uh, 
nice and extensive introductions, <laughs> so you all know us pretty well now. Um, I, we're going to spend um, oh, probably 40 minutes or so describing our, um, uh, our, our population measurement uh, focus and, and specifically with regard to our senior total health assessment work. Uh, I'm going to provide uh, some context uh, for the work and then Charlotte is going to talk about uh, a, uh, a, a, a very great application, uh, um, implementation of this senior health assessment in uh, KP's Colorado region. Um, so you'll be getting the, the overall framework for it, but, but a lot of information, a very specific application about how it's, how it's uh, embedded in the care of our seniors. So um, just in jumping into the framing, um, I think when the IHI triple aim came out um, in um, 2008, <clears throat> at KP we looked at that, and I'm sure a lot of healthcare, other healthcare organizations looked at it and said, well, we do that. Uh, we've got our triangle, um, and, and including me initially. Um, but the closer we examined it, I think the, the, the subtle and really important difference is, so our triangle was cost, quality, and service, and that's how we um, strategically framed a lot of our work. What uh, I think the, the important distinction is with the triple aim is that um, the triple aim takes quality and service um, and lumps the two together. Uh, into care experience, which I think from the perspective uh, of the patient or member is exactly right. Um, that distinction is in large part artificial and adds a third leg uh, to the triangle of, of uh, population health. Um, and it, th that's ironically missing from the cost quality service uh, framework. Uh, and especially relevant given the, the focus of healthcare on improving health, yet the absence uh, of metrics of population health uh, as outcomes for healthcare. Um, and it, in my in my role as uh, triple aim faculty, uh, one of the areas that I work on most is measurement, and it it turns out, not surprisingly, uh, that the population health measurement is the, is the most difficult and most challenging for healthcare organizations uh, 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 of all three aims. And so this is a, this is a framework uh, uh, for population health uh, that I think can help shed some light on uh, measuring population health and also the re relationship among the components the determinants and outcomes. This will probably look familiar to all of you on the call. There are, there are many different variations of this kind of framework. I think one thing that, that this helps to shed light on, though, is the important relationship uh, among and between the determinants and outcomes. So just briefly going through it, at the far left, are the upstream determinants of health, the, the social and physical environmental factors, which we all know are fundamentally important to health. When you look at uh, over the long run uh, cross-country and cross-social, uh, cross-cultural uh, comparisons uh, of health of states or nations or communities, uh, the, uh, a lot of the most important determinants of health are are in these upstream factors. You look at uh, income and education, um, and they're the most highly correlated with important health outcomes in cross-country comparisons. Uh, obviously, though, challenging, especially in the in the U.S., uh, with the independence of our healthcare delivery system from public health and social services, um, difficult for healthcare systems to address these upstream determinants, but on the other hand, fundamentally important for healthcare systems to take into account in providing good healthcare. Uh, and then those upstream factors 
uh, influence a variety of individual factors shown here. The ones that we're most uh, used to in healthcare are the behavioral and physiological factors. And, and the physiological factors, things like um, uh, BMI and, and blood glucose and blood pressure and, and uh, lipid levels, are the things that we tend to measure in healthcare in part because we can, um, but, but also because they are important determinants of downstream outcomes. But an important point is that they are not measures of health in and of themselves. Uh, in turn, the behavioral factors have a profound influence on these physiological factors. Um, as example, smoking, eating, drinking, and exercise are estimated to account for uh, something in the neighborhood of 80% of mortality. Uh, so um, the, these factors are more and more being uh, measured and taken into account uh, in, uh, in healthcare delivery systems as well. The other factors are more difficult to get our arms around, but also in, in the individual factor uh, component here genetic, spirituality, and resilience, but we're learning more and more about the fundamental importance of those factors on population health. As, as one example, the, the country of Scotland, uh, in looking at disparities uh, in health in, in their country, have really focused uh, national strategic initiatives on resilience, starting with very early childhood education uh, recognizing the important downstream consequences uh, of, of resilience in terms of disease incidence and prevalence in later life. These individual factors influence uh, intermediate outcomes of disease and injury. Again, things that we, that we tend to focus on and measure fairly well in healthcare, um, disease incidence and prevalence as part of um, disease management programs and disease registries. Uh, but it's also important to note that, that those aren't the same things as direct measures of health. Um, two people with exactly the same uh, uh, chronic condition and even stage of that chronic condition can have very different uh, perceptions of their own health and quality of life and functional status. Uh, so it's important when we're looking at, at, at measuring health to, to look at those aspects of health that matter most to people, which uh, I believe are their, uh, and this combination of length and quality of life. Um, and um, so health and functional status is really key. Uh, the problem is that healthcare organizations uh, tend to not measure that very well, uh, in part because it requires direct assessment in many cases uh, from uh, members or patients. Even those measures are, are, are ultimately not uh, uh, by themselves uh, measures of quality of life or well-being, which, which are influenced by other important determinants like meaningful relationships and meaningful work. And, and those, in turn, have feedback, important feedback relationships on all of the, and all of the determinants um, that are upstream of it. Um, two, a couple of other points to make here about the contribution of, contributions of healthcare. Uh, the first contribution you see in the green box of, of prevention and health promotion, uh, focusing principally on these both the upstream factors and individual factors, whereas the, the medical care component of the contribution of healthcare, focusing principally on, on uh, disease and injury and that relationship uh, between disease and functional status. The, I guess the last point to make in this diagram is that um, is about the equity box shown there, and that's um, in David Kendig, who uh, from the University of Wisconsin, who uh, developed the the framework of the county health rankings. In his definition of population health, distinguishes population health from individual health by adding this factor of the distribution of health um, in a community uh, represented here by, uh, here by equity. So that's a broad, the broad framing uh, for how um, 
we approach our, our uh, population health and population health measurement work. Um, and a few words just on the the use case uh, for for measuring population health, um, and I think that it it applies uh, in a variety of dimensions. Um, I think it's obvious uh, for individual care, um, individual patient care and engagement, the importance of of, of health outcomes measurement, including self-perceived health, pain, and functional status, those kinds of measures. In addition, though, at the population care management level, when we're looking at, uh, at, at uh, clinical effectiveness and cost effectiveness for population care, obviously we're going to, in order to determine that measure of effectiveness, the, the, the popu effectiveness implies uh, something about population health outcomes, which are necessary uh, for that measurement. And then at the at the, the outer circle, population health surveillance moves into accountability measurement. Uh, and when we're looking at, you know, fundamental questions like, um, are we improving in our healthcare system the health of our population? Um, m many, perhaps most healthcare organizations, including our own, have something in our mission statements about improving the health of our membership or population or patients. Yet. I would argue most don't have terribly good measurement systems for for measuring it, and then uh, I think it's it's uh, pretty self-evident that in all three of those dimensions, um, that population health care measurement uh, is very is fundamentally important to research and evaluation efforts. Uh, uh, just a few word on the value or predictive validity of of population health measurement, and then we'll, we'll move into our own measurement activities. Uh, I think I think you're all probably aware about um, uh, the importance and value of, of population health measures um, in predicting future cost and utilization and health. Um, it is it's provocative and dramatic, though, even when you looked at e we look at even uh, a single question. Uh, which is the, the standard question used around the world and, and used in uh, a lot of um, uh, both public uh, health assessments as well as health risk assessments. In general, would you say your health is excellent, very good, good, fair, or poor? Um, it, it is dramatically, remarkably uh, predictive of important outcomes like mortality, hospitalization, and high outpatient use. So you can see that uh, in this in these examples um, those um, with poor self reported health status compared to those with uh, very good or excellent uh, self reported health status have dramatically uh, worse worse outcomes in addition um, we've done some work and there's a there's a there's a growing literature about not it's not just that that um, measures of self-perceived health are good predictors in and of themselves, but even, even in addition to state-of-the-art predictive models uh, based on diagnostic history, um, that self-perceived health can provide added explanatory power to predictive models. So this is, um, this is an example. Uh, of, of work that we have done where we've looked at the added explanatory power uh, of just a few questions uh, from our, um, from our um, uh, health status surveys uh, where we're looking at um, this combination of three questions, general self-rated health, um, needing health with one or more activities of daily living and having a bother bothersome health condition. Uh, when you add that together with the DXCG score, you can you can add. I mean, not a uh, not a dramatic amount of predictive power, but an important amount of and significant amount of predictive power when we're predicting things like admissions, being in the top 10% of costs, um, uh, total cost and death. And you can see some of the statistics here in terms of the of the value um, of the prediction. Uh, 
it, here's just another um, um, simple example where we just took um, uh, from our um, uh, HCAPS, hospital CAPS uh, survey uh, data uh, uh, for those discharged um, uh, from our hospitals and looked at the, uh, which is, by the way, the, this general self-rated health is a, is a, um, is a component of the HCAPS uh, measurement survey. And um, as an example, so those who said they were, um, their health was excellent upon hospital discharge, 2% of them died over the next two and a half years. Um, and the, for, but those who said their health was poor, almost half of them died over the next two and a half years. Um, so again, just a dramatically illustrative of the predictive power. And in, in looking at readmissions, um, uh, something like 25% of those who said their um, health was excellent were readmitted over the next, I think it, this is a two-year time horizon, whereas almost two-thirds uh, of those who, who said their health was poor had a readmission. Uh, so now moving into, into uh, n not just the case for doing this, but well, I guess a part of the case, but uh, with in terms of uh, important uh, requirements um, uh, for doing this health assessment, the Affordable Care Act includes a provision uh, for coverage for an annual wellness visit for Medicare members. Um, and that, uh, that annual wellness visit includes a requirement for uh, a, an annual health assessment, which we've built and we'll talk about for our Colorado region. Uh, this is on top of uh, a number of other related uh, health assessment requirements. Um, in, uh, a welcome to Medicare uh, visit for new Medicare members. Um, for Medicare Advantage programs, there is a requirement to do a health assessment within 90 days of enrollment. Uh, for organizations that have special needs plan, uh, both initial and annual health assessment requirements. Uh, health assessment is a part of, um, is an outcome measure in the Medicare STARS quality bonus uh, from the health outcome survey, maintaining or improving physical and mental health is one of the elements uh, in the uh, pay, for, pay for performance measures uh, from CMS. Uh, and in addition, um, in terms of uh, meaningful use for health IT, um, uh, performance of these uh, on these annual um, health assessments is under consideration currently as part of phase three meaningful use. So a lot of, in addition to the in, to the value of this, uh, increasing demands from payers and purchasers to do these assessments. Um, I'm not going to get into a lot of the details here. Um, of the annual wellness visit requirements uh, of the Affordable Care Act. Um, you can see them, though, and that's the, it's basically uh, that the, while this is not a requirement, it's a covered benefit if you provide that service. And, and if members uh, ask for it, you are required to provide it. If you do provide it, um, there's a required both uh, health assessment as well as personalized prevention plan uh, resulting from the visit. Uh, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Charlotte now um, to talk about uh, our specific implementation um, of this health assessment as part of the annual wellness visit in our Colorado region. Thank you, Matt. I appreciate that. And thanks for the outline of our organization's approach to population health and predictive modeling. And, and uh, yes. We must rise to that challenge and the regulations and compliance issues that are associated with it, but the question for us as an organization and specifically in the region where I work in Colorado was how can we um, how can we do this in a in a thoughtful and meaningful way that um, that keeps our patients as our central focus and so um, both population screening and meeting the compliance issues around um, some new benefits around the wellness visit. So our challenge was to look at innovative ways to, um, to use a team approach to care and um, to use technology to support our efforts. So um, basically with a focus more towards the wellness visit, which is a population screening tool for our Medicare members, mostly geriatric, 
um, just kind of a, re a quick recap um, of some of those requirements for that health risk assessment. Um, so it must be administered prior to or as part of the wellness visit to collect self-reported health information. So likely many of the folks on the phone are familiar with those new wellness visit benefits. Um, they include welcome to Medicare visit for new Medicare members or annual wellness visits for um, folks that are um, already engaged with Medicare. Um, the assessment that's a requirement as part of that visit must take no more than 20 minutes to complete. Um, however, we were also all handed requirements that include um, specific criteria that we must collect as part of this health risk assessment. So, so we have 20 minutes, we must collect certain information, we must be able to provide this benefit, and particularly in Colorado, we really wanted to provide this benefit as that annual visit for our members. Um, in addition, we must provide a, um, a PPP, so lots of acronyms with these new visits and such, but a personalized prevention plan, which is essentially a summary um, and schedule of recommendations and um, recommended screenings to our member. Um, with feedback specific to the way they responded in the health risk assessment. Um, we also have to take into account that we'll have um, issues with making sure that we meet the needs, literacy needs of our members, language needs, um, et cetera. So we do um, have a tool um, that is, uh, includes more than just English. So, um, let's see. I am not changing slides. So perhaps I can ask Lori to take the ball because it is not um, advancing. Perfect, thanks. Um, so Kaiser Permanente does have, um, uh, again, more acronyms, a Medicare Total Health Assessment Instrument. Um, and as Matt outlined for us, it includes the self-rated physical and emotional health status. So we do ask our members to self-rate um, their physical and emotional health. It includes um, a frailty assessment and, um, and a report out on their ADLs and IADLs. So we're getting an assessment of how they think they're managing. Um, psychosocial risks, so these are all part of the requirements as well. We screen for pre-screen for depression and anxiety as well as some, as some of the other required elements of anger, isolation, and pain. Um, behavioral risks. So we're very interested in um, the opportunity to affect behavior change in our members. So um, their current and past tobacco use and physical activity, nutrition, oral health, alcohol consumption, sexual practices, motor vehicle and home safety issues. So we're looking at um, touching on some behavior issues. And once again, we have to keep in mind that we have to keep this at a um, at the literacy level that's acceptable and with um, other languages. Let's see. It's still not advancing. Charlotte, if you click on the slide, then it should be able to advance after you do it. And um, okay, so let me just kind of go through as we look at what we wanted to do, um, how we operationalize this in Colorado. So. In Colorado, we have the Pathway Program. That's a, um, a little term that we use in this region so that the folks that are part of this initiative recognize this work as related to this Medicare assessment. So the proactive assessment of total health and wellness to add active years to seniors. So um, our approach is obviously an interdisciplinary approach. We, we can no longer look at the way we approach this type of screening and care as only being delivered by the provider. Um, it's a team approach. Um, and our target is, of course, an annual visit to our Medicare patients who, particularly, with particular focus on those folks that haven't been in in the past year, and specifically folks that have chronic issues that we, we absolutely would like to see. Um, from this assessment, we are, were able to identify um, positive responses, so the folks that are self-reporting some of these issues. And this assessment also includes um, the five-star 
um, HOS measures like Matt, um, you mentioned the um, five star rating as well, but this is part of our five star screening using this tool as well. So um, we're able to identify you know, all of the positive um, triggers off of the assessment, but in particular we focus on um, fall risk, um, high risk medications or dangerous drugs in the elderly, um, depression risk, urinary incontinence, level of physical activity, um, whether or not the member reports that they have advanced directives or not put in place, um, malnutrition or at risk for nutrition issues, um, chronic pain, and anxiety. So there is a, um, th we do have a method to collect this data and then send it to our care teams to do a focused review. This particular slide mentions an RN review, but we actually have a team of folks on this pathway team, depending on the, the positive triggers. So if a member um, were potentially um, self-reporting at risk for fall risk, incontinence, et cetera, it may go to the RN, but if their only risk is perhaps um, nutrition, it may go directly to our dietitians or if it's um, singularly a, a mood issue or mental health um, risk issue, it may go directly to our psychologist team. So um, we are focusing on providing resources and attention and further assessment for those folks that are, are telling us in advance of their wellness visit that they have these issues as a way to support that member and also the provider at the time of the clinic visit. So um, this, this particular focus and outreach of care, it's meant to be delivered all prior to the visit in the clinic. Um, we also include, as part of this pre-touch, um, orders for pre-visit labs, um, an assessment for positive risks, um, a med review if the member is, is seen to, for instance, be reporting falls and also on one of the dangerous drugs on the elderly list, that would be a referral to the clinical pharmacist to review as well. So we have a team focus to this, to this care. And the little cartoonish slide off to the right sort of illustrates the, the workflow in sort of a cartoony way of, um, of how this is organized in our region. So we really looked at what's the best way to collect this assessment. And it really made sense that it needs to be done at the time of scheduling the visit. So when a member either requests their annual visit, otherwise or previously known as their annual checkup or some um, variation of what they perceive to be this annual wellness visit, that's when the um, efforts begin to provide this total health assessment to the member. So within our system, we're able to um, send that assessment either via secure email um, on kp.org or at the time of scheduling the visit, we can warm transfer the member to an IVR. So that's the interactive voice recognition or, or phone call, um, some of those phone calls that often if we get a cold call, we may not complete. But with this warm transfer process from the scheduling team, it's, um, we have some very high engagement there. And then prior to that visit, that, those responses are collected and scored. And that other mandate for that personal prevention plan letter is created within our um, electronic medical record for that member so that it can be provided when they come in for their visit. The staff at the clinic um, accept this member, room them, get them ready for their visit, provide their prevention plan, which can be reviewed by the provider when the provider enters the room knowing that the team referrals have already taken place and assessments have gone on and there's a specific focused area in the record for that team um, to have documented what their assessment or recommendations or discussions were so that that can be reviewed right at the time of the visit. And then of course ongoing um, collaboration continues depending on what the issues were or what they're dealing with. This just gives a quick overview, this slide, of um, the focus on the patients at the center. So this comes up quite a bit in, in discussions here within Colorado that 
Um, we know we have certain regulatory um, compliance issues to meet, but we want to continue to keep our patients at the center and look at how we take those things and um, assure that we're supporting that patient um, in a way that's really meaningful. So just a quick outline of what we just kind of went over. We have scheduled a visit, and that triggers the workflows to collect that health risk assessment. It's collected in advance. Um, we're using technology in our region we have access to, and we've created some other avenues, for instance, the IVR, to collect this health risk assessment, knowing that it's really quite onerous to, um, to do that at the time of the visit, summarize it, get a letter together. That, was, that would have been much more challenging. Um, we do have um, a Spanish translation, and um, I know other um, languages as well that we don't use as as frequently. Um, key here is being able to quickly score those things that are at risk for the member, um, some of those issues that we talked about, and creating that plan, prevention plan in advance, so that that is done to support the visit and it's not something we're doing at the time that they arrive necessarily. So we're addressing those care gaps with the, with the clinical teams versus waiting for that referral when they arrive at the visit. We've already sort of queued up or set up success for that visit. And then, of course, as Matt was talking about, we're very interested and excited about utilizing the, the self-reported um, information from our members against what we actually capture and um, how we can potentially use that to help us um, do some predictive analysis of how to improve or support the care that we provide now. Next slide. Right, this is also being used, these uh, wellness assessments, as we mentioned before, um, Welcome to Medicare is uh, one of the visits that's provided as a new benefit and also an annual wellness visit. So the approach um, within um, our organization is to make that welcome to Medicare visit actually our, um, our first touch with our new Medicare members and to provide this assessment. In addition, we are looking at um, collecting um, the clinical components that would support that new member visit as well. And that's um, still affectionately referred to as the new member module, but um, we have a welcome to Medicare visit, we get some prevention information, and we also want to collect through this technology um, some of the clinical elements that will support that provider as well to decrease our um, voluntary terminations or those folks that are perhaps dissatisfied with um, their onboarding or as new members not quite satisfied. We're trying to support that with these visits. And lastly, I'm not sure why I can't get the presenter slide, but we'll just move ahead. Just to give you an idea of what we're finding um, in, in our region, um, positive triggers. We talked about the things that we're looking at that are um, our patients are self-reporting. And many times the question is, so what percentage of your membership or your patient's uh, panel are positive on the things that you're um, asking? And this particular um, slide demonstrates a only close to 8,000 uh, folks uh, as our um, as our group, but any positive at all is 67 percent. So um, we know these are issues that we, if we're not currently addressing, that we should. Um, and the percentage of folks that are positive on only one of all of these multiple issues was 32 percent. Um, two was 21 percent, and of course, once we get to three or greater, it gets down into the 14 percent range. And then below that shows you of those things that are positive, um, the percentage of that close to 8,000 folks um, that were positive on each area. So high-risk nutrition screen, that six plus is just an indicator of um, a score we assign to each of the questions as far as risk. Six percent of our um, folks are approximately six percent of our folks are self-reporting nutrition risk. That could be anything from food security to dental issues to um, a variety of issues. 
Um, fall risk is quite high, as is urinary incontinence, both things um, very common in this group. Um, and we're approaching both of those with our um, primary focus on behavior um, classes. We have a better balance class, and for urinary incontinence, obviously, some um, pelvic floor exercise classes all provided by, by the region, and that's what we're focusing or directing our members to engage with primarily, if it's possible and if it's appropriate. Um, mood screening um, for just the PHQ2 and GAD2, if they're positive on either of those screenings, that's a trigger for a further assessment. But about 11% of our folks are positive on the pre-screenings. Chronic pain that interferes with their functioning or their daily life, not just pain, but that's functioning with their abilities. Um, and um, the frailty or risk scores that Matt mentioned, which are very important and interesting to look at and um, help us support our predictive um, goals. Next slide. What do our members think about the Medicare Federal Health Assessment? We were very curious to know um, how this would be received. Um, and so there was a, a lot of thought around how we were going to get that feedback. Um, our members, actually, across the board, which is very surprising, we, we weren't sure that it would be as warmly received, but they absolutely love this assessment. So they're expecting their annual checkup with their provider. What is considered at this point to be sort of an added bonus is this additional screening and outreach that's all part of that visit. Um, they thought that this assessment took a reasonable amount of time. The feedback was about 96% of the time. Yes, they said that it was reasonable. We're looking at approximately a 12-minute or so completion rate on average to complete the assessment. Um, we were most surprised, pleasantly surprised, that the IVR was rated um, easy to use. We were um, under the impression that it would be difficult for our Medicare members um, or an older population, potentially, to use the IVR or to engage with it or like it. Um, however, it was rated as fairly easy to use. Our kp.org entry is very easy. Um, we're actually, in this region, able to capture just right about 50% of our membership will complete this on kp.org. Um, most dear to our clinical team's heart and those things that we love the most are that the members are reporting that they felt that the issues that they were self-reporting in this total health assessment would not have been addressed had it not been um, pre-screened in this total health assessment. So um, these were not typically the issues that were addressed in their usual annual checkup, which were very much focused on um, maintaining um, their medications or conditions. This was a little bit more, uh, well, a lot more prevention focused, and so that was the defect there. Next slide. So what's um, being discussed in our region, obviously, measurement of the quality outcomes. So we're doing a lot of assessment. We're gathering a lot of data. Um, what are we seeing in the way of quality capture um, around these improved assessments? Um, we're looking at how we may potentially approach our seniors or our Medicare population um, who are not currently receiving these wellness visits. So at this point, we certainly want to outreach to those folks that um, have issues that we would like for them to address on an annual basis and have them come in for these wellness visits um, and certainly provide this visit to those that request it. Um, but for the rest of the membership, what is our approach and, um, and how will we um, look at doing this assessment for the whole population? Um, we're also looking at how do we um, provide this visit potentially with um, a different level of provider. We started our pathway work using only the um, PCP as the provider, and in this year we're looking at, and it's perfectly um, uh, um, acceptable from the CMS perspective to have a different level of provider provide this visit. So we're looking at um, within this population, which portion of it would potentially be best suited to a PCP visit, uh, and what group may be perfectly fine to provide this at a mid-level um, role. Um, most excited in our region are the other populations outside of our Medicare group. Um, we have a lot of interest in how we can do this type of broad population assessment 
and um, self-rated um, health assessment for all of our populations and not specific to Medicare or our geriatric care. So um, these are some of the things we're looking at this year. And I definitely want to mention that um, much of this information came from my um, project partner here in Colorado, who is listed at the bottom of this slide, um, physician Wendy Gozanski, who is my project partner in Colorado on the pathway work. And that's it for that slide. It, uh, thanks, Charlotte. Um, it, uh, there was a question along the way um, uh, um, with um, uh, Jeff Yi asking uh, who your who the target population is. You mentioned patients not seen in the last year, and the question was it was for this visit type or uh, but seen for other reasons or not seen in the clinic mm -hmm. at all. So maybe you can address that and and where you're headed with this in the future as well. You bet. So um, patients not seen in the in the last year, typically it's not just that they haven't been seen in any venue, but for a focused either annual wellness type visit or um, the previously provided annual physical, um, which was for 2012 um, not available as a benefit for Medicare folks. So um, that's what we were looking at. We had folks who were um, might be considered at risk with um, multiple chronic issues um, that we would reach out to to come in. And I'm thinking, let's see, the other question was? Well, going forward, the target population. Oh, and going forward, right. So that's still under um, review, I would say. Um, if, if you're looking from the perspective of our geriatric department or our senior programs department, the um, the goal would be that that every senior member receives this assessment in some way or other. And there are some discussions about how we could potentially do that outside of even the wellness visit. Could we collect this assessment data outside of a focused wellness visit? We haven't solved for that quite yet, but that would be the ultimate goal. Um, it does increase our um, resource needs and um, you know, has its own challenges. So. Um, but that, that would be obviously the way that we would wish to go. That's the senior leadership here wants it every Medicare member screened. <laughs> yeah. so. And, and, and uh, um, there was a question from Deborah Lopez about the measurement results being presented for the entire year. No, they're not. Those measurements were for a very um, short period of time. Let's see, that was about a two-month um, snapshot of two to three months data. Um, so, um, uh, right after launch um, in 2012, that was not a full year's data. We didn't um, actually operationalize this um, until halfway through 2012, fully operationalize it until halfway through 2012. Um, Another question there, Charlotte. Do you see it from Pat Teske? From Pat. In addition to providing information about advanced directive, do you follow up in any way to determine all patients' wishes and document them? That is a wonderful question. And we are very focused in this region on, um, and our palliative care department would be so pleased to hear that question. <laughs> We're very much interested in the uh, meeting the member where, where they are. And so um, we do have a very strong focus on not just um, finding out if they have advanced directives, but really understanding um, what they wish for their care needs, and um, looking at their health, population health in general. Um, if, their, um, if their goals are aligned with ours. So perhaps not all of our clinical metrics are applicable or necessary or advised for our folks that are potentially um, you know, in the highest risk stratification or, or maybe towards end of life, et cetera. So, we have a focus group and led by Dan Johnson um, here in Colorado um, around a very clear focus for how we will approach these advanced directive needs. We, we really, really want to improve and um, provide what they need. Uh, but I would say, uh, in addition, nationally uh, and in other regions, we're also beyond palliative care and advanced um, uh, directives looking at at um, uh, 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 incorporating 
into our tools for care planning, care plan shared with uh, the member and and um, the provider about the member's wishes in general for their care and their health. Um, so that would ultimately feed into uh, advanced care planning, but it's just more broadly care planning and articulating uh, their health goals uh, that we want to capture both in our member portal and then as part of a, what we're calling a health action plan. Um, there are a couple other questions. Should I try to respond to Matt? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so um, it looks like we have a question uh, um, again from Jeff Yi about the um, data on the impact on resource utilization. Yeah, there did we did have to put some thoughtful um, planning in place as far as some of this the resourcing, and so we actually piloted our um, interventions, as it were, for I'll just use an example: the Better Balance or Fall Prevention class. Um, to look at of those folks that we refer to that class, what is the utilization? And we built our team based on um, on that on that information in the first half of 2012. So it, it did require some resourcing, but um, it's it wasn't quite as intense as we um, before the pilot we predicted. So we're providing once a month classes, et cetera, within our region within the clinic, and that seems to be pretty successful. So. Um, I think you, if you want specifics, we, we could maybe touch base later, but we, we definitely had to look at resourcing some of those interventions. And the number of interventions suggested and implement, implemented, any sense on utility on patients with more chronic morbidities versus less chronic. Um, not specifically on um, diagnoses or morbidities, we did in fact look at whether or not there was um, uh, a difference or a disparity between perhaps age groups, thinking at first our 65 to 75 group would be quite different from our 75 and greater group in the way that they responded or their needs. And we were actually very surprised to find that there was very little disparity in the way they responded. And so we're, we're approaching that care um, similarly. I will say, though, that we're learning still and we're finding that perhaps um, we do need to sharpen some of our interventions depending on um, uh, specific situations. Right now we have a more broad approach um, to our interventions because of the volume, but um, we're looking at how to sharpen that even better. It's something I wish we had done earlier and we're improving on. In, in phase two of our evaluation work, uh, phase one was more focused on um, usability and perceptions from providers and patients about utility. Uh, phase two will be on actual measurement uh, of uh, did, did this intervention, did this health assessment and annual wellness visit uh, change behavior and change utilization over a, over a, a longer period of time. So, um, uh, but did, since this is only the uh, beginning of the second year, we didn't have enough information to do that evaluation in the first year. Matt, do you want to speak to the literacy needs or translated materials at all? Or um, well, we've you know we've done a. Um, I, I don't think you've implemented yet, Charlotte, but we we have completed a um, uh, Spanish translation and and um, Mandarin Chinese uh, translation. I think that there there's additional demand for Russian, which we haven't done. Yeah. Right. Um, uh, in terms of uh, in terms of uh, the broader question of health literacy, even in English, um, that was um, done through uh, uh, pre-testing and pilot testing with our evaluation group, uh, as well as running the questionnaire uh, through uh, readability grading. And I think we're it's I think it targets either fifth or eighth grade reading skills. Right. And we do use the Spanish translation in Colorado. Oh, okay. Which is, Good. Yeah, we do use that. Um, okay. And the last question I see posted was, can we discuss how we assess frailty? So um, within our region, we actually have a um, care coordination team. It's a it um, consists of registered nurses, all with a special focus in geriatrics or elder care, and they actually have a a frailty algorithm. So they're looking at 
um, at, even though a person is triggered for frailty, um, how we do an additional level of assessment to know um, what our interventions will be. And probably not surprisingly, we're firstly looking at um, that member's um, perception of, the, of their rated frailty and um, advanced directives, um, caregivers, um, assuring that we have um, HIPAA approved contacts, that there are some um, careful thought about future planning, just having some of the conversations um, that surround frailty in general. So they have they have an algorithm to to work upon work with. And and the the frailty assessment comes from some predictive modeling work done by our Center for Health Research in Portland. Uh, mm -hmm. That um, it's a uh, it's built on a on a uh, a larger frailty assessment model, um, and it but they they've done a, a, a short version extract. I it, that's three or four items, and I believe the items are general self perceived health, um, uh, one or more health conditions inter interfering with activities. Um, uh, I think it was bathing or dressing assistance. Uh, in one other one, but those but those three to four questions uh, right. uh, 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 produce a frailty score, um, okay. and then that frailty score has a positive trigger associated with it. Um, and frailty broadly defined as predicted to need help uh, uh, from another person or institution uh, to meet um, uh, uh, daily needs. Great. Um, hey, Charlotte, this is Lori. Um, could you speak a little bit to some of the challenges or some of the biggest challenges you guys face in implementing this? <laughs> well, I would say um, really it's a, it's, a, it's a paradigm shift, and that was the biggest challenge. Everything else could fall under um, a, sort of a predicted project management um, model outside of the acceptance of the shift to um, population screening on a broad level and and predictive screening and and the team approach and and things that were um, I would say newer ideas of a way to approach care for our senior members than than we had previously not that it was Ever wrong, but but it was just that was the biggest hurdle was will we accept that it is a good idea to um, approach our care with a team based model and and use technology to support that visit once we got past that and looked at the clinical benefits and quality outcomes that were potentially available to us by also meeting these compliance issues. Um, everything else eventually um, fell into place. Yeah. I, so I'd add, um, and I so recognize that there there are a number of of representatives from safety net organizations uh, on this call that that you know don't have the same level of resources or electronic record integration as KP. Um, but I would argue that that it's possible and appropriate and valuable to implement something like this even without those electronic tools. That said, I think for KP, a, a really important part of the work was to, to make this, and I think it's true this is generalizable to any organization, um, is to make this uh, as easy to do as possible, to make the right thing easy um, is the is the is the motto that we kind of live by with this work. Um, and so we spent a great deal of time and energy integrating this seamlessly with our electronic medical record, which has produced many, many headaches for many of us. <laughs> uh, 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 but but uh, in terms of, I suppose, net headache, <laughs> uh, once it's seamlessly integrated with the EMR, it, it makes this, it, it dramatically improves the efficiency of the workflow. I don't think it's a required component to do this. And in fact, there are uh, right now, um, these assessments are being piloted in, um, 
in uh, pioneer ACOs around the country uh, with varying levels of electronic decision support. So this can be done with paper and pencil. In fact, has been done in other and is being done in other KP regions with paper and pencil. Um, but but obviously the the less burden, um, the, the more value in terms of usability. So in Colorado, we we worked hard to. Um, uh, put this up on our uh, member portal so that it can be completed electronically as well as by interactive voice response. Um, but paper and pencil works as well. Well, great. Well, thank you both so much for a great webinar. Um, lots of great questions, too. Um, if folks, um, we're just ending the hour right now, but if folks could please just take a just a few seconds to, um, to complete the survey um, that's in the polling section, we would really appreciate the feedback. So thank you, Charlotte and Matt, again, for, for your time. And thanks, everyone, for joining today. Good. Thank you.